right. In the Northwest, there are four different trees that go by the common name cedar. C-E-D-A-R. None of them are actually true cedars. Um, the genus cedar is in the pine family and it grows in the Middle East. Um, our cedars here in the Northwest are all in the cypress family um, and they aren't, don't look anything like a pine family member. Um, all four of them have scale-like leaves and a decussed arrangement, meaning opposing pairs. So one set of leaves is um, on the left and the right. The next set up, the twig will be on the front and the back. And you can't see the twig because the, the scale-like leaves are completely covering it. So if you look at this, this kind of gives you a good sense of that. This is one segment on, on the twig. Here's one pair of leaves on the left and the right, and then we can see the leaf that's on the front, and there's a matching one pairing up on the back. Okay, so the tiny little leaves, really you can see that they're segmented, so looking for that segmented look is one way to identify a false cedar. The other thing is um, the sprays of foliage in the false cedars lie flat, almost like someone ironed them. So very much, they're two-dimensional. Okay. They don't stick out in all directions, and that's how you can tell them apart from other uh, conifers that have scale-like leaves like juniper. That said, they're similar, we call them cedars, but actually each of these four different species belong to a different genus, every last one of them. So it's probably the hardest group of conifers to learn. The tree I'm standing beside here is an incense cedar. It's in the genus Calocedrus. Full name is Calicedrus decurrens. It has um, scale-like leaves, obviously, but um, it's got a yellow-green color on the top and the bottom and no clear pattern of bloom on it yet. So the top of the spray and the bottom of the spray look the same. Okay. The other thing about it is that the segments, and I don't know what the best way to do this, if I put it in this one, here. If you look at those segments, um, those set of four leaves, you can see that they are longer than they are wide. So the segments are elongated. For the other three different false cedars, they are not elongated. So just that characteristic alone is good for incense cedar. Um, you can see on this little spray here, the male strobiles, they're tiny and yellow and um, they kind of start coming out uh, in late fall winter time. The cone, which is pictured, we got some cones here. Um, these are last year's cones. I don't think there's any young ones here yet, but um, they start out all closed up. So these are the scales. The only th It started out with um, six scales, but it ends up where you can only see three. And um, they're actually in a decussed arrangement, which is a little odd, but the three here in the center, the seeds were here. When it was all closed together, it was shaped like an almond, and it was green, and then it turns this pretty brown color, and then it pops open. And then it looks like either a flying goose, some people say, or a fleur-de-lis, or a beak with a tongue sticking out, whatever works for you. But basically, there's three scales that are hinged together and open up um, in a, almost a valvate kind of um, pattern. And that's incense cedar. The incense cedar starts out with scaly bark and then it becomes deeply furrowed and kind of a beautiful orangey red color. Really pretty bark, which you can probably see in there a bit. Yeah. Incense cedar is um, the most drought tolerant of the four and it grows in um, both sides of the Cascades and also the coast range from about central Oregon south down through the Sierra Nevada. Um, over here, we have a different false cedar. This is western red cedar and the scientific name is Thuya plicata. So now we have Calicedrus for incense cedar and now Thuya for western red cedar. So looking at a spray though, you can see that it's got scale-like leaves covering the twigs. Tiny, tiny little leaves in a decussed arrangement and that the spray is lying very flat. Um, Western red cedar looks very fern-like, frond-like, 
graceful compared to the incense cedar, which looks a little shaggier uh, than, than the western red cedar. Beautiful yellow green on the upper surface. And then if I come into the shade, maybe. There's a very distinctive pattern of um, bloom on the undersurface of the spray. It looks sort of like, um, some people think it looks like butterflies, if we put it maybe this, you know, that way. Butterflies stacked end to end. Basically a repeating pattern on the underside of each set of four leaves. Some people say it looks like a bow tie. Um, different things. It's also very flattened. So not only is the whole spray flattened, but each of these tiny little side branches is also very flat. So broad, but fairly flat. And if we come over here, we can look at the cone. So the cones are small. They have a papery texture. They are composed of numerous sets of um, valvate scales, and they have a decus each set is decusset. So there's two scales, then the next setup is two scales, and then two scales. So it's the same pattern as the leaves. And they open up and they look like little flowers, little tiny woody rosebuds, and they're on the upper surface of the branch, often kind of covering the upper surface of the branch. So one of the best ways to tell the false cedars apart are with the cones, because each of them for the most part, we'll see that there's a little confusion, but for the most part, um, they're distinctive. Western red cedar is found in moist sites throughout the Northwest. It's pretty abundant in the coast range and in wet spots in the Cascades. You can even find it into the interior Northwest in the Northern Rockies where there's enough moisture. Um, and it is, you know, one of the most important trees in the Northwest. It was incredibly important for material culture for the coastal people. Um, which would, the, the bark, which you can't really see on this tree very well, is um, fairly thin, dark, dark brown and fibrous, and it pulls off in long strips. And so that, that fibrous bark was pounded and made into cordage and um, clothing, woven into clothing, baby diapers, fish nets, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the, bar the tree itself, the wood, is very, is very easy to split. You can actually split off whole planks from live trees um, and easy to work. So um, it's been used for making big uh, plank lodges and um, buildings and also dugout canoes. And then, you know, with uh, uh, the white settlers coming in, there was a very lucrative business chopping down western red cedar and, and splitting them up for shingles. Um, their rock, the wood is rot resistant, so it's used for roofing and siding um, and uses like that. Um, very easy to work with, so friendly to hand tools. Also, the roots were dug up and used for basketry as well, so it's just a, the tree, the name Arborvitae, which is the, another common name for Thuya. Kind of fits this tree pretty well. It really is a tree of life and very widespread although um, with so much logging that's happened in in the western red cedar it does not regenerate as well as some of the other species so it's actually declined significantly in the west uh, in the northwest over the last 200 years. Okay. All right this is one of the four uh, fall cedars that you're going to be learning this term. This is a Port Orford cedar um, the scientific name is Camma cypris Lawsoniana. It's also sometimes called Lawson cypress. Uh, if you look up at this tree, you can see that it's quite a big tree. Uh, very Whoa. tall and droopy, droopy foliage. It has scale-like leaves in a decusset arrangement. And the sprays lie flat which just means they kind of come out on two sides of the main twigs and they lie fairly flat like a fern frond. They're tiny, tiny leaves um, and they ha can have bloom on the upper surface or they can be pretty green on the upper surface and then the underside there's a pattern of stomatal bloom that looks like uh, repeated X's going down um, kind of following the outlines of those tiny scale-like leaves. So I don't know if you can zoom yeah, I'll in on zoom in on some like of these puppies. better of a focus here. Oh, come on. Sorry, folks. 
I'm gonna walk out to the light maybe a little bit. I saw it before, but now it's hard. All right, you see those little X patterns right along the leaves, like right there. Yep. All right. Um, and then the cones. Um, the the male cones are tiny. They're really small, but the female cones are round. You can see them here, actually. They start out looking a lot like a juniper berry. Um, they do have peltate scales and they have bloom on them so they often have a bluish color. So they look, they're about the size of a blueberry, um, round. And then when they're ripe, they open up. And so you can see right into the um, center of the cone, sort of like a little jack, uh, like that kid's toy when you play with jacks, the way it pops open or like popcorn. Um, and the, each of the scales is wrinkly. Um, and doesn't really have a pronounced prickle on the backside. Um, Port Orford Cedar um, has a coastal distribution, has a very small range from about Coos Bay down to Northern California. Um, it's usually found on the western slopes of the coast range, although it does come further inland in Northern California, um, all the way actually to the Mount Shasta area, but it's more common near the coast. It likes a fair bit of moisture. Um, it has uh, nice aromatic rot resistant wood that is very similar to a sacred um, white cedar or camasipris that's native to Japan and has long been an important export from Oregon to Japan where it's used as a replacement for that sacred tree, the Hinoki cypress, um, used for things like uh, temples and uh, caskets and things like that. Um, Port Orford cedar has been affected by a non native root pathogen, fungal pathogen, called Phytophthora. Uh, it spreads in soil, it spreads in water, and so what it tends to do is it moves down with water through the drainage. So uh, Port Orford cedar tends to grow in moist areas and all, and it moves, uh, that the disease moves from higher elevations down with the water flow. But also um, foot traffic, truck traffic, all that stuff can also um, spread the disease and there's very little natural immunity in Port Orford cedar to the disease. So uh, one of the principal ways that uh, the stands are being protected uh, is through quarantine. They actually lock up those different stands and don't let people just travel through them. But to end, I want to just have all four of these false cedars together on this board so to point out the characteristics that are separate them. Put myself to the other side. All right, so I'm gonna start down here, actually, with the Thuya Placata, which is the Western Red Cedar. We don't need this now, so close. So Western Red Cedar, um, green above, but on the underside of the very flat sprays, there's this repeating pattern of bloom that looks sort of pale, pale green kind of in color. And you can take it to the shade if you need to, but, um, It looks sort of like butterflies, like a butterfly stacked on top of a butterfly stacked on the top of a butterfly. And then the cone is papery in texture. It has multiple sets of decusset scales um, and they open in a valvate pattern. So they open up from the bottom like the hinge open and they look like little flowers, little woody rosebuds. So the other fall cedar that has a bloom pattern on the undersurface, and just the undersurface, is the Camasipris lawsoniana, which is Port Orford cedar. In Port, For Port Orford cedar, you can have some bloom on the upper surface, but it should give it a sort of a grayish green color. But on the undersurface, there's a repeating pattern of white X's for each set of four leaves. So it's like a big stack of X's one on top of the other. It, you'll notice too that um, the sprays are not so flattened as what we see in the western red cedar where not only is the whole spray flat but each of these little tiny side shoots is also flattened. They're less so here. Then also the scales in Port Orford cedar are even smaller. They're really tiny. Um, has much finer texture to it. And you can find them growing in close proximity. They do share range, those two species. Um, the other difference, the cones are obviously very different. The cone in um, Port Orford cedar is that round one with peltate scales that are kind of grayish. And they look like little jacks that pop open. Very different than the woody rosebud. 
Um, and then the, the pattern of bloom here, it's just more complicated in the Thuya. Here it's just more of a crosshatch. Okay. Then there's the two that don't have bloom, or at least the top and the bottom look the same. Um, the first one is Calicedris decurrens. It ha is incense cedar. Incense cedar has those um, elongated segments where they're longer than they are wide. The only one of the four that has that characteristic where they're longer than wide. So it looks more, the segments are extended. The top and the bottom look the same, sort of a yellowish green color. Um, even though the name's incense cedar, it smells just as sweet as all these others. They all have a pretty great smell. Um, but the cone is very distinctive also in incense cedar with these three um, scales that open up so wide here in this valvate fashion with one in the center. That looks like a flying goose or a fleur de lis. And then finally, Alaska cedar, Calotropsis nucatensis, that has bloom, sort of a grayish color. It's definitely got more bloom than incense cedar, but the top and the bottom look the same. Very flat and droopy. And then the cone is different. Here it's more like a camisipris, where it's round, sort of pea-sized and shaped, and has uh, peltate scales with a prickle on the back. Okay. So uh, for the fall cedars, it's not just memorizing all those names, it's remembering all of those four cones and then those patterns in the bloom. Um, and also remembering that um, if, it's, if a spray does not lie flat, it can't be one of these four. So ruling it out into a subgroup um, of just these four species. And then working on it from there, but it takes practice. It's a hard group.